Hello and welcome to the bonus podcast for episode 441 of Conversation Street and this is a character profile time, a classic character profile time of somebody who um, has only just kind of come, come to our attention really, hasn't he, in the, uh, in the curry annals. It wasn't like he was hiding on purpose. No, we're talking about Fred G. Fred today. G, perhaps an easily overlooked member of the Rovers bar staff. Well, I think so. I mean, it has taken us 441 episodes to actually get to him. But you know what? We still haven't even done Emily or Alf Roberts yet. So. <laughs> well, we've got other things to talk about. So we, we, I, I'd watched him and I remember kind of liking him from when I saw him on the Granada Plus episodes um, from all his escapades in the Rovers. Because he was the, he was the cellar man, wasn't he? The pop yes. man there. But you knew absolutely nothing about I'm, him. Because he's, he's, not, he's not really there as, you know... A, in the Corrie history books particularly, he is he? He the... seems fairly overlooked, even though he was in the show for a good, what, nine years or so. Yes. It, yeah, I think it's because he was in the show alongside some rather legendary characters. That's a really good point, actually. I, I think he he contributed just as much as they did. And we've talked about this before, about the dynamic of behind the seat, behind the... the that was just Not Rovers possibly. gold yeah. time, Behind wasn't it? Behind the bar of Rovers and how that, those characters all together, you've got Bet, Betty, Annie and, and Fred. What a, what a team. Really, really interesting group of characters. And again, and again, it's one of these things where they're interesting because they don't really get on with each other all the time. Mm. And they don't mm. always have to be nice to each other. Well, Fred wasn't really a nice character, was no, he? he? Yeah, he was, he was also quite sympathetic, despite being a basically a massive lech. Yeah, he was, a, he was like... Um, he was like a dog's body, but kind of like everybody took everything out on him, didn't they? Mm. And sometimes he did deserve it and sometimes he didn't. Yeah, totally. Well, listeners, you may not also know anything about Fred G, so allow us to inform you by telling you yes. all about his time in the Rovers. And you may be a Fred Ignoramus by now, but by the end of this, you'll be a G whiz. You were sorry, waiting I've been waiting for to that. say that. I was just trying to I'm kind sorry, of get it, it took, in there. It took you so long. I'm sorry I was waffling when you were trying to insert your pun. So Fred G was born on the 6th of October 1929. God, that's a long time ago. And he died in 1998, apparently, off screen. Um, he had a brother and a sister. We know nothing about them apart from they exist. And he uh, married twice. Um, he's He spent... I mean, it seems like a lot of his storylines in the show were about chasing women and trying to get wives and girlfriends. Oh, well, and... you wouldn't appreciate that, Michael, because you got lucky when you were very I got lucky with me, first but, time. But um, if, you, if you hadn't, perhaps you might be. A massive ledge. Yeah. <laughs> he married Edna G um, at some point, I don't know, 50s maybe. And um, in uh, 1981, he married Eunice Nuttall, which was a wedding that we saw on screen. Um, he first appeared on Coronation Street on the 29th of September 1975 before bowing out on the 28th of November 1984 after 561 episodes. So fairly decent chunk of time. He was... Really. Look, back in the day, if you were in the Rovers, you were in... You were on screen... All the time. Basically. Not like these days. No, no. Um, he was played by another Fred. Fred Feast. Great name. Yes. <laughs> I do think Fred Feast is a great name. It is. It's, but yeah. it's like... what it, It's also quite befitting of such a, a portly a gentleman man. As, uh, as Fred was. Uh, now, he had been an extra on Coronation Street for a little while before getting the role as Fred. Um, doing various... I think there might have been an episode where he's like a postman or something. I remember him coming into... Either the cabin or the um, or the corner shop or something we saw him, but um, one particular one credited part that he had before was in 1972. He played a barman at the Red Lion Pub, also called Fred. <laughs> He's obviously got a look of see, there look must of be Fred something about in his um, in his contract. It's like I can't be bothered remembering names. Yeah, something. Just call me Fred, and then I'll remember to look when my name gets called. Yeah. He's probably got he's, he's getting he's got his name sewn into the back of his underpants as well, just to yeah. remind him. Um, there was there was in that scene Edna G, the character who was who preceded Fred G on the show. She was in it. She was at the she was at the red line apparently, but there was no hint that she was married to Fred, which is why people was... think that that wasn't actually Fred G. Yeah, that was okay. just other barman Fred. It's a nice solid name for a barman, isn't it? Fred I mean, the barman. If you were to tell me that there was a factory somewhere in Greater Manchester churning out potmen who looked like Fred G and they all the all they all look the same because that factory 
just only had one mould, I think I would probably believe you. Yeah. Because he does look like... He looks the part. He really, yeah, he looks a good stout northern stock. Yeah, good for, good for hefting beer barrels yeah. up the steps of the Grover's cellar. Yes. Um, he was also in an... Un, uh, Fred Feast, that is, in um, that Rest Assured pilot, which was the un, un-aired spin-off that had... Um, Jerry Booth and Ray Langton in that we saw that. it. We saw it. We saw it at the Cory Fest. I'll watch it again. I know. I'd quite like to see it again. Now we <laughs> know more about Jerry attention. Booth. Well, th- this was like uh, this was like seven years ago or so that we watched it, um, and and I think it would mean a bit more to us now. But he, I, he played. Oh, I love Jerry Booth. I don't remember who we played, but it was probably called Fred. Fred. <laughs> Something like that is probably for safe to say. And he'd had a couple of smaller TV roles in the 10 years before Fred G first appeared, including an extra in Emmerdale. But um, Coronation Street, I would say, was his big break and also one of the last TV roles he had. That was like, you know, in Out Shake It All About Show Business, really. Um, on creating the role of Fred G, Fred Feast said so, that Bill Podmore said... Right. <laughs> this is a multi-layered you, quote. You got getting this This is Fred Fredception. <laughs> I... Bill Podmore apparently said, according to Fred G, I want a gritty barman that will take Coronation Street by the scruff of the neck. So I did my research in the bars of Salford and came up with Fred G. So, yeah, based very much on actual you know, barmen, potmen of, of, the, of the era and the location. So. I wonder what he, what he sounded like in real life. Because, obviously, I think pretty much most of the original cast or the very early cast were all proper northerners weren't they yeah. they were all a- they were all northern actors but if you listen to them talking even even annie and jack and elsie and ina if you listen to them talking in real life they're mm. all like yes i was approached by the coronation street actors to produce this um, I know, character i i get the feeling that fred feast you know he doesn't was, look was who like, he was yeah i know that's what i'm that's why i'm saying it i i cannot imagine fred feast sitting down for an interview going i was approached by bill podmore he said i want a gritty barman that'll take on the coronation <laughs> street by the scruff of the neck and I so can't... i went to salford and we found a pub. I found a quote from Fred, and I don't, I don't think I've got it here. When I was trying to f- find my best quotes to think and to to include, and yeah, I haven't got it here. He basically there's one of them where he says, "Look, I I I'm a proper northern stock. I I do this role. I can play this part, and and that's who I am." I'm paraphrasing, but I'm also I I'm also a massive pervert. I, yeah, maybe, maybe he perhaps yeah. not. I think there were shades of Fred. Beast in Fred G, let's say. Okay, well, we can pick and choose the nicest bits. So he first appeared in 1975 when it was Edna's 40th birthday, and that was the day before she burned to death in the Mark Britton warehouse oh, well, fire. I'm lucky. So he kind of he, he shows up, and then um yeah, the next day he's just a, a widower, which Aww. is sad because Edna had been in the yeah. program a couple of years before, hadn't she? She she wasn't particularly remarkable to us in the. In Not the episodes really, no. that we'd seen on the DVDs, but there, I remember there was one scene where she was dragging a guy up to bed at somebody's party or something. Mm. She was a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a flighty madam. Um, but yeah, she 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 was gone, and, and Fred came and replaced her. And he's obviously I'm not a lot more sure memorable. Whether she was supposed to be married when she was first in the show. I'm not sure either. I they don't do... know if she was being an adult, an adulteress, or mm. whether they just kind of didn't write that she had a husband. They do like to invent husbands for some characters you know after the yeah. fact don't they like like i mean ivy yeah. she was in the show for a very long time before it was revealed that she was married to bert and she'd referred to previous husbands with different names as well beforehand and, and then vera. it was all yeah vera is another one she's she's talked about jack and then he appeared at gail and brian's wedding then, yeah. didn't he and then he didn't appear again for a little bit but it's like their production team are like good god there's an unmarried woman in the cast Ooh. we can't have that how disgraceful <laughs> i think you're right i think you're right so he he was just in like a couple of episodes at the end of nineteen seventy five for the for this warehouse fire stuff, but then he came back in nineteen seventy six, um, when Annie was looking for a new live in Sellerman, and this was after in mean, a while after Jack Walker had died, and she was struggling to cope running the Rovers on her own. Mm. I think it was about, um you know Rovers had been broken into, uh, Newton and Ridley were thinking of getting rid of her because yeah. she was you know getting a, getting a bit old. So she's she... also also there's a lot of sexism and they were like oh, mm. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. can't run this place by herself. Mm. It's a public house. So Fred comes along to the interview, um, in in a 
just pretending that he's the sort of person that Annie Walker would snap up. He's like, you've got a suit on, he's presentable, he's polite. And she thinks, oh, th- this, is, this is just who I want, a real kind of gent. Nice, yes, a nice gentleman. But, um, yeah, not, not soon after he gets the job, he you know, drops the act and the, the real Fred begins to And what would you the say surface, the right? real Fred was? He's just in, in the mould of the typical, archetypical Corey, um, lout, lazy, layabout. Lazy, yeah. Idle, um, shiftless. He, yeah, shiftless, that's Slightly a good way for stupid. it. stupid. Um, yeah, un- under the thumb of any woman that he comes into contact Hen-hecked. with, really. Yeah, totally. You'd think that we might get Womanizer. fed up of that sort of character on Coronation Street because no. there's so many of them. But no, it's a, it's, it's a stereotype. It's so it true. is. It's I a... mean, we, we say like the, the Corrie can sometimes be a bit sexist because of all the, the battle axes and harridans that have been in the show and how um, women are sort of portrayed as like... Um, Moany uh, nags, yeah. But then you got you got the flip side of the coin when the guys don't really get a very fair shake. It's either. a tale as old as time. <laughs> yeah. Um. So he, th- this is when he starts his attempted romantic conquest of every woman on the street. Yeah, tell you what, with, he's really ambitious. He and really confident. is. He's he doesn't give up, does he? No. And sometimes he gets lucky and he, he's able to like take a woman home. Remember there was an episode where he gets, um, doesn't he have a yeah, woman and he, he does, persuades yeah. Eddie to let to, him go to, in yeah. or to go in the, and, the, and the woo house. her in number 13. Yeah. But then Eddie gets a girl and brings her back. So he's like, yeah, he he's was, got, he's got the magic sometimes. touch. So no wonder he's a trier because, well, if it works, you know, if your dice has got a six on, you're going to roll it. Yeah, you know, every now and again. So yeah, he he goes after Rita first, who is not interested in the slightest, and is able to deflect him by telling him that she's actually going out with Derek at the moment. So she must have been desperate I mean, to have uh, that... gone, gone chosen him over over Fred. I think the only reason that would put me off is because it shows she got terrible taste in men. <laughs> well, may- Mavis wasn't happy with this, as you might imagine. He also has a brief fling with Vera Duckworth, which I don't think I realised until I, I I did that little bit of research at the weekend no we i don't think we saw any of that um annie is not keen about this relationship though because you know she doesn't want the likes of vera duckworth hanging around in the back of the rovers lowering the tone of the place or even coming into the front of the rovers more than (laughs) is absolutely necessary well vera and jack both had affairs didn't they oh yeah that that's one thing we've seen about jack and vera like really i mean everybody knows about the the vince sinclair carol monroe dating agency yeah. scene but they they really were really, basically an open so. marriage yeah it really was yeah y- yet at the, by the end of it jack and vera uh, have become you know the most loving inseparable iconic, iconic romantic couple. yeah and so i've seen some people criticize coronation street for what they turn jack and vera into but it, oh, it's so sweet you know i i love i adore it's jack's us, death because yeah. of just that very reason and it's easier for, for us to accept it because we weren't our first introduction to jack yeah. and vera wasn't this very early version of them where no. they were both just randy as hell but not for each other they were they remind me of like you know the twits just always getting one getting one yeah. over the other one yeah. but anyway we're not talking about the duck no. are we we're talking about fred although fred could be an honorary third twit honorary twit yeah yeah annie basically plays gooseberry whenever vera comes round, and vera soon gets the hints and and bogs off um at the end of 1980 sorry 1976 he Alf and Terry Bradshaw, who is Reenie's brother, I think. I think that's right. They buy a greyhound called Fred's Folly. Why does um, he get to name it? Or maybe it, maybe it was Folly. already called that. And he was like, that "Oh, that's are. great." Well, that's why they bought the the Betty's Hot Shots horse, wasn't it, in the nineteen nineties? Because they see that it's like, "Oh, it's called Betty's Hot Shot. We got to buy this." It wasn't really named after Betty, but I don't know. Why we would it be called this. Betty's Hot Shot without the reference to Betty's Hot Pot? That's what I don't understand. <laughs> um, so anyway, this dog makes a, a pain of itself by running in front of Annie's car, her famous Rover, which is gets a lot of mention in this character profile. And then she swerves into Stan's uh, uh, what, what's it called window cleaning cart. Dog disappears, and Fred basically is lost, left to mourn his lost earnings. So that's uh, that's his sad tale from nineteen eighty six. Um, very little in 1977. He, it seems like Fred's story ramps up as the year goes on. And I suppose if you're a barman, like you said, you're always going to be in the show, but you're not necessarily going to be at the forefront of the show. Your own story. No, but, but I mean, 
they, they, they almost didn't need it. They didn't need stories because the relationships, the, the dynamics between all the characters and the rovers were so good. They didn't, they didn't need to have a story. They just needed to have, you know, the odd scene with Fred being an idiot and, and Betty on Bet or whatever coming out on top every single time. But anyway, they, they go on a fishing trip, um, Alf, um, Fred does with Alf and Rini and Mavis in 1977 and the, and the women end up falling into the river. I'm sure Fred Fred's probably really did some other exciting things in that year, but um, that, that's all I got for you. I'll, 1978, Gemma, I'll, I'll pass over to you. Well, the rover fails its MOT and Annie blames Fred. And then as a joke, he dresses as a chauffeur for the next time he takes the car out for her. And she really likes this. And she's like, you have to wear it every time you drive. So that kind of backfired. Yeah, Fred, Fred basically... Fred was the, Fred was like her driver. He he was, and he quite liked it though because it was his fancy. Was it Rover Two Thousand? It was he, a posh car. Yeah, yeah, he liked the the responsibility. He liked um, the status that that gave him, and he sometimes would use that to try and pull the birds. Yeah, he as did. Well. He still wanted to borrow the car quite often, but he always had to have a reason. He was really really proud of that car. I love I love Fred in that car. Yeah, um, he held holds a Lancashire themed evening in the select. Which goes well until Annie's rover gets stolen from outside and the police come around and they arrest him for serving drinks after time. And the rover turns up later undamaged, but there's a note saying the tappets need adjusting. I don't know what a tappet is. That's where you tap it and it stops thing. clunking. <laughs> um, Fred is offered a tenancy of a, of a pub called The Mechanics. But only if he's married. This this is the beginning of quite a, a, a saga, isn't it? Yeah, this Fred? is Fred's like, now I have a reason to be a womaniser. Yeah. He has to settle down now. He's, he's got ambitions and he needs to be married. And it's really interesting. We always think about how much marital status affected how a woman could navigate the world and how she was treated and what she was referred to. And uh, and we don't really think about it being a hurdle or anything for a guy. Like, most of the time, it seems as though the characters of Coronation Street, the men, marry a woman so that, that someone can cook his tea more reliably. <laughs> but here, Fred needs a lady to be able to take his this position yeah. in a pub. He proposes to Betty and Bet. And a flying horse barmaid called Alma. But they all turn him down. Not so really surprising because he's not got a lot going for no. him. Then he dates a married woman called Wendy Williams. It changes his mind when her husband's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> that sounds good to me. You you can have her. Yes, I think Fred realises that... Um... She can't be that much of a catch. No. But he can talk. In 1979... He started taking bets for horses over the bar. So people would come in and say, I want I want to put, you know, two pounds on the three fifteen at wherever race course. Entry. Yeah, wherever. And then he phones up the betting shop and um and places the bets for them. Oh, does Thing he? is, he doesn't actually get round to that bit and he's just taking everybody's money in. But he ends up getting into a bit of trouble when Mike Baldwin's horse comes in and and he hasn't he he, he wins forty pounds, so Fred has to kind of Get get this forty pounds. I often know where to pay Mike back. Um, he so he takes it from the till and gets in trouble with Annie, naughty man. Um, so she Annie decides that she's had enough of Fred driving for um, in nineteen seventy nine when he gets the rover impounded. Um, this came about after he um, p- parks in in, a, in an illegal spot when she sends him out one day to try and find wood pigeon for some fancy meal that she's putting on. So. Um, she she's like right. I can't. You, you can't be trusted to look after the car anymore. Billy, son, my son Billy, come and take Fred's job. Billy is not interested in being the pot man at the Rovers, so he gives Fred the money to give Annie to pay the fines. He's like Fred, no, you have this. You have this money. Give it to Annie. Saying, give it to me, mum. Say that you're paying for it. You see yourself, and we're so square, all right? So Annie's like, oh Fred, you didn't have to do that. That's really that's really sweet of you. I'll pay half of it, and you pay half of it. So for once in Fred's life, things actually come this up trumps for him now. He gets to keep half of the uh, half of that money. One that of Billy the very gave rare times that he ends up. Um, Get coming ahead. He he yeah exactly. That that was one of the things about Fred. He's just one of these characters, like he's the Ogdens always in a way. That out. He's always, the Ogdens, I mean, the Duckworth. Yeah. Nothing ever seems to go right for. They kind of have it coming, but you still feel sorry for them. That's what that's the appeal of the characters for me anyway. Yeah oh yeah totally. But I mean he's the, also the sort that would crow when. Oh he's very insufferable. I mean I don't know do really know right why him. I like him, but I really I really I 
really do to I know, like I know. Him. Great story towards the end of 1979 where um, the next woman on his list, um, on in his hit list, is Audrey. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely um, batting above his, uh, his way, above yeah. his weight there, yeah. So he, she's like... She makes fun of him because he's going a bit bald on top. So he and uh, gets a wig, and there's a great scene where in I can't remember he's in the Rover's toilet or yeah. somewhere, and he's he's got his wig on and he's looking all proud of himself, much in the same way that you know twenty years later or fifteen years later, Reg Holdsworth would get his toupee and think that nobody noticed. Oh, it's not and fair. Then, great, great scene in the Rover's where Fred comes out for the first time wearing an. In- incredibly obvious hairpiece and everybody's there do you remember it was rita yeah. rita spots it and she's like mavis don't look, don't, around. Don't look around and mavis immediately turns around yeah. and everyone's trying not to trying say not to mention it trying not to stare but not being able to help it and then albert tatlock ends up coming in and is like what bloody hell you got that on your, on your head yeah for? <laughs> they're all they're all trying not to mention it because they didn't want to draw attention to the fact that they knew he was bald before well i think that, that it was like well it's also kind it's, of stupid it's a cry for attention from fred i suppose it's almost like saying look at look at me look how youthful i am but he yeah. but he didn't want to be oh, this is why you don't <laughs> You don't get an obvious hairpiece, but it's a. Uh, it's not really. F- I feel sorry for men. I would, yeah. Would Would you want me to get one? No. I'm I'm, I'm going bald from the front, so. I know. Only I'm I'm not having anything at back to cover like Fred did. Anyway, that that was that was a really funny episode actually. So it's, that's one to watch. Um, I pass back to you. 1980, he starts a barbershop quartet to compete with a flying horse. And this is quite a funny episode as well, where he, they sort of, it's his idea. And because he was, was like, it's it Alf and Eddie that are with them. And, and then they remember, had to find maybe. another person. And they spent ages trying to find somebody who can sing. And then when they all tried to perform together, it was apparent that he was the worst singer out of everybody. And he gets kicked out, basically, of his own barbershop quartet. Mm. Yeah, and Rini takes his place, doesn't she? I think so. The relief bar made Arlene Jones gets told that Fred has mental problems. Um, so he, she's like trying to see. Yeah, she, she's, she's, she's trying like to check him out to see like him, what's yeah to to see what it what she's talking about, and then he thinks, oh, she's she keeps giving me a, the eye. She must fancy me. Oh, she's obviously romantically invo- interested, um, and she ends up having to set her husband on him and leaves the, leaves the room. Bet was such uh, bet bet and, I mean, yeah, f- bet and. Fred had this real antagonistic yeah. relationship and it wouldn't even kind of put it on a brother sister kind of um it's not like Maria and David where they're, they're sparring with each other but there's affection there it really did seem like they didn't like each other but Fred still would have jumped on her if he'd had the chance which mm. is really weird it's, it's something really unsavory about how desperate Fred was to get a woman and even, even though we liked fred we did enjoy the women getting one over him didn't we yeah i mean betty Cause, back cause in bet, her was day, just, bet, bet was such a you yeah know, cheeky she madam she just could, could put that cow. grin on yeah she she loved putting people down and it wasn't like in an affectionate way it was just proper vindictiveness and betty if you think betty's a sweet old lady you need to go back and watch a classic horror because she is a cantankerous old cow mm. who used to spend most of her time stropping off and quitting yeah. and having to be coaxed back annie as well was also good in this relationship because she would but most of the time just kind of stand back because it was you know below her to, yes, to, right, to rile yeah. up the pot man but then if when she sees bet having a go or you know winning getting one over yeah. Fred she would allow herself a little <laughs> with, I know, with Fred. With it was literally I think everybody it's because against everyone him. ganged up on him like I think he did get bullied at one. he totally did <laughs> But he asked for it. They just got I the balance know. just right. I, it, there was never a time when I watched out, it and yeah. I was like, no, this is this is it's not fair. This isn't fair on him, him anymore. Yeah. It was it was a simpler time and were it to be were it to be now it would be slightly problematic and you'd have to sort of talk about the gender and the dynamics and blah blah blah, but you can just enjoy this for what it was, which is just a load of nonsense. Mm. Now, finally, his boat comes in in nineteen eighty one, Eunice Nuttall he meets at um, a singles evening. And she's quite a looker, as you, this isn't she? She's well to do. She's she's smartly dressed, um, and it works. She, they they hear it right off, and they get married in May. So like a couple of months after meeting at the singles night, 
there together. And we, we quite like Eunice. And this was a series of episodes that we ended up watching, didn't we, in, in 1981, about him and her um, attempt to buy, get, a, get a pub. And all, and Eunice was a lot more put together than Fred. I don't know what she saw in him. No. She was well, well she that's was neither attractive. did anybody else. She wasn't an idiot. She was sensible. She had a head on her shoulders. I think that she was definitely um she wanted to be upwardly mobile, didn't she? She was she had places to go. She wanted to achieve things. Mm. She saw Fred as her meal ticket. And I also but, think it was a bit of a marriage of convenience for both of them because she well, she had she she had not been married previously. I, I can't, can't remember. remember, but she certainly. I don't think she had children, or she did. No. They were grown. No, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, so she was a woman of a certain age who mm. was husbandless, and like Fred, her ambitions required a spouse. But I don't think that she was. I, th- I do think that she was in a way besotted with him because, like, she used to call him Freddy. Didn't she? Yeah, like she okay. was a bit, but, she was a bit dopey. But, but you know, him, I don't but... think they would have ever ended up together had they not have been of a an age where the um, the competition was right. the fields of competition were it thinning. Was, it was a bit of a mystery, and, and it didn't last very long either, did it? Which is a shame because I, I I I quite liked Fred. Finally, you know, bagging his woman. But so they tried to apply for a pub together, but then they're turned down, which isn't great for Annie because she said, well, when you're married, you can come and live with me in the Rovers. And she soon lives to regret that because she doesn't like the idea of being, you know, it, those two against her. Oh, yeah, uh, exactly. Because and... it, it wasn't her house anymore. Yeah, basically. Because um, there were two, there were two women of the house and there wasn't enough room. Yeah, Eunice takes that woman of the house role seriously doesn't she she's like this is my place now well, I'm, you know, I'm ruling the roost here and and annie mrs walker you you know you don't need to worry about a thing anymore i'll i'll sort things out and annie liked to be in control still yes it was kind of it was a very apt demonstration of what tony warren originally wanted for the show which was matriarchs of the north mm. in their natural habitat like the domestic queens yeah uh, and there there can't be two queens in one castle. Mm. And it also reminds me a little bit of Downton Abbey, where you had the Dowager... Um, yes, yeah. I mean, D- Dowager Countess and, and yeah. Annie Walker are definitely cut from the same cloth, aren't yes, they? Yes, definitely. So we, uh, we, um, we see Annie supporting their um, efforts to get a pub, but then when they're turned down by Newton and Ridley, she f- she rings them up and is like, what, what's going on? I, I, I gave them my highest recommendation and it turned out that Eunice had a, had a bit of a sticky-fingered past See? In, uh, in pubs that she'd worked in before. Not quite as nice as she was no, first appeared. No, but eventually they do get another job elsewhere. They go into the community centre just across the road and um, they get a job in the caretaker's flat. Uh, basically, Annie gets fed up with them and, and encourages them to, to find new abode so um fred's bullshit attitude isn't particularly welcomed by the uh the community people that go there and um in the end by the end of the year eunice has left him she's offered a job at a hotel by um that's owned by um a guy called ben critchley who's a counselor that um was was related was linked to the community center um so yeah she she swarms off with this ben bloke and, and that's Does she, it she go out with him i can't remember yeah, yeah, I think... This I think... is what I meant when I said that she's ambitious and her relationship yeah. with Fred is definitely... I mean, you're going to suck up and feel... You're going to feel happy emotions and affection for somebody if they are facilitating your dream of what you want to achieve in your life. Yeah. Not necessarily... Um, I mean, the fact that the personal. marriage didn't li- didn't last more than six months and, yeah. it's, and like, Fred wasn't, you know, unfaithful or, or anything. I, I don't think he deserved to, to no, be walked I know, out but I also... on. I think yeah. you're right. She she liked the idea of the high life, living in a hotel. Don't want to be stuck here in a community centre flat. Sorry, but I she need to climb the next. She had and graces. Yeah, yeah. she le- thinks she thought that the ladder. Fred was the the only meal ticket, and then she found another one. Yeah, <laughs> basically. But we didn't see her final episodes, did we? No, I don't we think didn't. they're on the DVDs. But yeah, really nice little you know series of of episodes mid 1981 to watch. We really got invested in that. In 1982, poor Fred has back problems after he falls down the cellar steps and he threatens to sue Annie. So, but she arranges for a masseuse to come and help. I think, oh, was it Bet? Somebody. I, can, I think they're kind of together. Yeah. Because Fred ends up bedridden, which, yeah. which um, fit he, right into his layabout uh, ways. He basically kind of puts it on a lot and gets people to wait on the hand and foot. Yeah, and the they, fact that he was threatening to sue Annie just goes to show what a, a you know how out get. for himself he was. Yeah, um, how far he could get. He 
wants a sweet Swedish masseuse to come. Well, I bet I think Bet tells him, or or you know, um, makes him believe that there's going to be this beautiful, blonde, voluptuous Swedish woman that's going to come and rub his back for him. So he's in bed there, you know, with his, with his neatly pressed pyjamas and puts some horrible aftershave and stuff on. But um, alas, it is a rugby club guy, isn't it? A physician or something, some, some burly bloke with a sweaty hands that comes and does it instead. Eunice returns because Ben has been violent. <gasps> And he helps her to leave the hotel, but he refuses to take her back and files... Good for you, Fred. Divorce. Yeah, so that definitely ends the uh, mini saga of Fred and, and Eunice. Uh, 1983, so, he, we, you know, he's, he's divorced, he's back on the pool, he's single again, ready to mingle. First um, Valentine's Day... In fact, the, the only Valentine's Day in 1983, I don't know why I said that. Valentine's Day comes and he sends a card to Susie Birchall at number... Who's she living with him? I think she's living at number 11, um, along with Elsie Tanner and uh, Marion Yates. And he addresses it to the, the redhead of the of the house and nobody knows who it's to. But yeah, that's, it uh, turns out to be Fred trying to woo Susie Birchall. Definitely not interested in him, though. Um, and then... Dream comes true. He might not have the woman of his dreams, but spring 1983, he gets the car of his dreams because Annie, uh, sorry, Eddie, reverses his uh, bin lorry into the front of the Rover. And again, Fred, poor Fred, he just gets the blame for it, doesn't he? All he well, does, he, he drives the car around to the front of the Rovers to pick Annie up. The the bin lorry is there in front of him, but... It, he just assumed that no one was in front of him and backed into it, basically. Yeah, it was. Um, it was definitely... It was just um, an accident, wasn't no, it? No, it was... What's his if, face? Eddie, Eddie's fault, if anything, yeah. but he probably couldn't see it in the mirrors. But, um, yeah, poor Fred gets the blame for this. Um, anyway, the, the rover is declared a complete write-off by uh, Brian, wasn't it, who, who saw it. So Annie has to get rid of it. Um, but So Fred gets the money. I can't remember where he gets it from, and he buys this, this rover. So this car that has been his pride and joy for all these years, and he's been so, you know... Yeah, so He's proud. Been so covetous of it all this time. Yeah, now at last it's his, but not for long, because May Day was it, nineteen eighty three. <laughs> this is when he takes Bet and Betty well, to see, Tatton look, Park. This is another example of how creepy he was as oh, well. Oh yeah, I know he because was because he basically spends the whole day. Well, he he kind of convinces Bet to go with him. Uh, uh, because he wants to sleep with her and they they both have made it clear that they don't really like each other but he still is more than willing to have a go i know and, give it a punt um so she's she realizes that she could be in a bit of trouble here if she goes with him it's not like bed uh, not bed fred is you know dangerous or that he would try to rape her or do anything not, do you like think that so? i don't agree with you i think he just you know try and get a bit a bit I, handsy. He'd get okay. a bit Ray Crosby about it. I don't think that's nice. It's No, it's not. But I, I, okay. th there was never anything sinister no, no, no. about but, Fred, no, can I, I tell would you, say. Can I tell you that it's only portrayed that way because this is what it was like to be a woman in the 80s and and be, before then you just had to accept that a guy would touch you oh yeah exactly permission. i'm not saying that it's so acceptable it was, but, it but back then it wasn't portrayed as sinister and wrong but it is yes no no you're right in in those days in the days of you know, carry of on things, and all that there's a lot of things that we think are funny and, and fine and not problematic at all now that in that's why benny hill was okay years. to show on the tv back in those days but i don't think it'd fly in 2000 uh, in 2020 you'd be surprised what people think about benny hill even now he was it he was a bit benny hill now i come to think about it wasn't but he it fred was like, i could imagine him chasing day, after all was, those women it was <laughs> well if you're a good looking woman you're gonna have a man who wants to touch you up and you're you have to just giggle and run away yeah well bet's the dolly bird isn't yeah, she basically in the short skirt that, that men can't help themselves and it's your responsibility well, like? to continuously guard your honor Anyway, so she's like, well, this this could get serious. So she makes Betty come with her. Yeah. So and like and she, she's like the gooseberry. None of them really want to be with each other by the end of this no. agreement to go. Betty doesn't want to, uh, Bet doesn't want to be there, but she's kind of, I can't get out she of it. She talked herself doesn't, into it. Betty doesn't want to be there with those two, but I think she likes the idea of going to a well, park she because she out. just wants to go out for a bit. Fred doesn't want to be there anymore because Betty's there. So what's the point if he's not going yeah, to get his end exactly. away with Bet? 
So they so end they, up yeah, yeah. sitting by the side it's of the like lake. It's like a Mexican standoff yeah. of, a, of a day out. So they all go off together to the side of a lake. Yeah. and um, Well, he gets the car before Brian's finished with it. Yes, Brian's been realize. Brian's been working on the car and um, hasn't fixed the brakes. I think Gail gave it to him. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fred okay. goes around the garage and gets the car off, off of Gail before it's actually ready. And, if, so, and just yeah. to just to say, if you did, if you didn't know who Fred was, you might not realise that Brian is Gail's first husband. He was a mechanic and the first mechanic on oh, the yes. street, and he was quite. A was he the first mechanic on the street? Well, he was. The, yeah, I think so. Uh, if the, one of the first. Who do you think the other one is then? There were builders know. on the street. Was Billy probably... Walker? No, he wasn't. Either. Oh no, you're he owned right. the garage. No, you're right. They? Actually, you're right because Billy and, um, and... what's his name? Elsie's, Elsie's husband, Alan, Alan, Alan Howard. Howard. Yeah, he was the mechanic. I'm wrong. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. So anyway, to cut a long story <laughs> short, the rover <laughs> ends up. All misinformation. The rover ends up going down the hill into the lake with Bet and Betty in the back seat and Fred's just there because he doesn't it like a case if he closes the boot down on it and that yeah makes it... and it, they sail away that is a literally. real real classic w- one of many great well remembered scenes from 1983 then, Coronation then... Street he has to go and rescue them and hoik up his trousers it's really funny because this is a demonstration of how self-sabotaging they all were and their hatred of each other because Bet and Betty are, are in this car floating around in the in the lake and and their only hope for sa- salvation is Fred, and they're still there going, Fred, you stupid idiot, come and get us now, otherwise we're going to shout at you. And like if I was Fred, I'd just give him a shove and walk off. <laughs> and that is when Bet ends up getting put down on a slap bang in the middle of a big cow plop. Yes, on the bank. So what um, a mayday that was. Towards the end of the year, he gets into a fight with Eddie on his uh, stag do. Um, Eddie stag do that is because he and I can't remember. It, this is when Eddie's um, fiance Marion turns out to be pregnant, and I think Stan announces it, it or whispers it to Fred, and then Fred announces it. So they they get into a big yeah. They were keeping it quiet because that. Marion's mum yes. wouldn't approve. Yeah, so yeah, he, he he punches Eddie in the face again. Not not a very nice not a very nice guy really. Um, no, and, but what do you mean not a nice guy? Well, just just punching punching Eddie on his stag do like. Oh, yeah, he punched he, Eddie, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Eddie ended up on the floor and we had a freeze frame of his sad little face. Oh, yeah, we did, didn't we? On, on his stag do. Um, no, they also, they also had a little story in 1983 where the, um, the, the men, the rovers, uh, men folk, get into a, like a way off, a bit, a bit like they've had in some recent stories. Do you remember when they had the one a few years ago when they were trying to reduce their heart age or something oh, yeah. like that? Tim and Dev like, and Steve. You can tell it? that they wanted it to be a weight loss thing and they were like, we can't have a weight loss thing. It's not politically Yeah, so correct. they have an initial weigh-in and yeah. Fred tries to cheat by putting coins in his pocket to weigh himself <laughs> down. I think he gets caught out. I can't remember. I assume he does. But yeah, he, he, he was a massive cheat as well. And uh, and so so we get to 1984, his final year on the programme. I'll leave yep. this one to you, Gemma. Well, the rover breaks down and, and Fred pers- persuades Jack take the car away i can't remember who jack is jack duckworth jack oh yeah jack duckworth <laughs> not God. jack walker in i was getting really again. confused um fred first ways jack to take the car away so he can report it's stolen but the plan falls through because jack gets arrested at a petrol station so fred decides to raffle it off and nobody's interested but and percy wins it for a pound and then he sells it to kevin for 50 pounds and then it ends up being used for banger racing. That's oh. it's, it's sad, but kind of funny, isn't it? This car that was Annie's... Pride and joy. Yeah, for, for all these years. It's like one wow. of the most famous cars, famous vehicles on Coronation it Street. And, it's, is, yeah. and Coronation Street isn't really known for its famous cars because... There isn't anywhere to go. There's, no, there is, there's nowhere to go. And you either Where walk there or head to off to the, in the direction of the tram station or maybe a Weatherfield Wayfarer. But it's because nobody on you know, current, current Coronation Street has a a car parked outside their house long. Nobody knows where they live. I mean, other famous vehicles, you've got like you know, Mary's camper van, Derek's car with a paper clip on top. But but yeah, this... The Woody. This, oh yeah, the Woody, of course, yeah. But yeah, th- this car that, that Annie just thought was the bee's knees finally ending up as as an old banger for banger race it is kind of oh it's, it's tragically sort of, hilarious yeah, really. i know it is it's <laughs> like a story of fred's life yeah but it's so, so the... sad for fred that after he finally gets in this car that he's wanted all this time it ends up in a lake and then <sighs> this happens to oh well he becomes a temporary licensee of the rovers when annie retires he gets fed up with bet 
acting like she owns the place. But then he ends up in hospital. For, he gets food poisoning because he bought cheap pies and he insisted on trying them all after they had a complaint about it. Yeah, so to prove again, that they're all okay. Bitten yeah. on the bum by that. Billy Walker takes over at the Rovers and clashes with Fred and Fred's like, well, you can't, you can't fire me. And Billy thinks, yeah, well, I don't need you anymore because um, I'm in charge. We don't need to sell them in anymore. So Billy was, Billy Walker was a, a massive arse when he came back, wasn't he? I never really liked him anyway, but he, he was, was particularly... He was always a bit of an arse. He was particularly mean when he came back this time and, and yes. to poor Fred as well. But yeah, it's true because the only reason that Fred got this job in the Rovers to begin with is because it was owned by Annie Walker and she needed a man about the place. And now She needed somebody to heft the barrels. Yeah, and now with Billy being in charge... It's like I can have to my own barrels. Yeah, your 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 job is is no longer required. Billy tries to fire Fred when he's seen out at the races when he said he was supposed to be job hunting, and then Fred dem- demands severance pay. So Billy decides to goad Fred Fred into punching him so he can sack him, and it does work in the end. And Fred gets thrown out on his ear. Yeah, I think I think Billy ends up getting talking to someone over the bar one day and says, "Look, I heard this worked at another pub." So the uh, the barman there. Or the, the, the landlord there persuaded one of the barmen he wanted to get rid of to punch him. So then he could just sack him. So worked again. Um, so he gets a job working for Mike Baldwin at the factory and gets into a scam with Jack where he pretends to be Mike, which I think he thinks involves sitting behind a desk and smoking a cigar. Yeah. Which really, that's all I've seen him doing, <laughs> apart from sleeping with other people's wives. And he, daughters. Yeah. Mike sacks him. Well, everyone's someone's daughter, if you're a lady. <laughs> Mike sacks him when he returns from a business trip and finds out what has been going on. Yeah, they're basically selling a load of stuff and pretending that they're saying, I'm Mike Baldwin. Well, there's a bit where they're like, can you make, can you write us a check? And they do, and it's written out to Mike Baldwin. And they're like, oh dear. Whoops. Um, I didn't really find that. I I didn't like him working it. It wasn't. It was, it was, it was kind of pointless. It almost seemed like an attempt to say, oh, let's see where else Fred can work. And I know it can't have been because it was, it was part of his exit storyline, although his exit came, it was a bit more abrupt than I think had initially been planned. Yes. Um, Fred makes his final appearance at Stan's funeral before he leaves the area and he just never talks to anybody he's ever known ever again. No, literally, Fred is wiped out of Coronation Street. And, yep. and that's one of the reasons why he's kind of one of the most more forgotten characters of the 1980s of this real classic era when there were wall-to-wall well-known uh, iconic names and he's nobody yeah just nobody really talked about him again so really he's forgotten sad the number of fairly prominent characters and actors that got cut out of the show because they've made some mistake or they decided that you know the, the ver- various kind of scandals that happened behind the scenes were well yeah the, fred fred feast's um exit was another one of those kind of scandalous ones apparently in 1983 1984 i can't remember he took some time off of the show saying that he was depressed but then he was seen out and about seemingly fine so well that's just silly to say that you can't be depressed. yeah i know i think these days you might think well you know maybe he still was depressed. you know depressed and in a bad place but um yeah he he got into trouble with the producers over over this um I mean, for, in in 1990, um, Bill Podmore, one of the producers at the time, um, one, of the, one of the big name quarry producers, um, didn't have particularly nice things to say about Fred. He said, uh, Fred gave us all all more than our share of trouble. <laughs> he was not much of an ambassador for Coronation Street, and there were several occasions when I hauled him into the office for addressing down. On one particularly embarrassing occasion, he distinguished himself at a variety club dinner by shaking bottles of champagne and spraying anyone within range. How very dare he. This sounds like the sort of thing you should do if you're a celebrity. Yeah, but he especially in especially in Coronation Street. Well, back in the day when they were basically mega stars, mm. like nowadays, if you're in the soap, people like to poo poo and say, "Oh well, you know, n- not not a good at not as good at acting as other people." You know, mm. soaps where you end up if you can't do anything else, which is completely the opposite of the truth. Or where you start off before you get a proper job. Yeah, I think yeah, people are very snobbish about. Soaps, but back in the day, they were like mega stars. Yeah, yeah. Well, he he didn't like him, and also at the very end, um, Fred Feast um refused to sign another contract. Apparently, they were going to keep him on for a little bit longer after this t-shirt scam story. 
Um, but he was like, no, I don't want to be in this anymore. It, apparently as well, um, the last couple of years, it, it, the, the, you know, the appearances of Fred had ramped up and it was apparently not, not as fun or as easy to, to work on anymore. And he's like, no, don't, don't fancy this. And he said, I don't want to be uh, become another Coronation Street cabbage, as in, you know, referring to, to someone who stays there for a long time and uh, the, the, the not necessarily... You know, just be, gets t- turns into an old. Fuzzy I think he dirty. was like, I don't want to be a comfortable. Yeah, I don't want to be comfortable here. Yeah. And I, I think just he'd... be a coronation. Like this is all I've ever done. I don't want that to be my legacy. I yeah, guess. yeah, and I think he'd seen as well what had happened to the likes of Bernard Ewans and and where he just you know you see him turning into an old man and sort dying. of wasting away and, and dying on screen basically and it's like no, I don't fancy that and 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 Peter Dudley. Um, as well, died on uh, died. Uh, who was Bert Tilsley died while he was on the on the job as well, and he just he just wanted an escape really, but he, he it wasn't a particularly um, acrimonious split apparently. But um, yeah, that that was it for Fred. He was mentioned again in nineteen ninety nine because Eunice G comes back into the show for a, a small amount of time. I think Fred and not Fred, Jack and Vera um, meet up with Eunice G after all these years, and she's got a B and B. And um, we learn that um, that Fred, the character, died the previous year, so she must have stayed in touch with him, I guess. But that that was kind of sad as well, and a bit a bit close to the bone, because in real life, Fred Feast died of um, abdominal cancer six months after these scenes were aired. So, oh wow! And and, what, and when they were aired, when oh. they were being produced, he was he was he not was well. He yeah. was he spent basically the last year of his life in hospital. Oh, I read, God. so it's a really sad end for him, really. Which you know, it's uh, we we hear a lot of when we're doing these Coronation Street classic character profiles. So many of these big name, you know, Corey stars. They do seem to have tragic ends, don't they? Yeah, I don't like it. A lot of them he really, said, really um, do. I was there for ten years, and for the first day, I enjoyed it tremendously. It was only in the latter stages I found it so hard work because I had so much to do. Yeah, which is which is why I wanted out really. And in ninety six, he said, "I'm I'm still recognised by people who recognise me from Coronation Street." Only today I was in town in Scarborough and holiday makers were saying, oh, look, it's Fred G. <laughs> I signed five autographs a day. When I was in the street, it would be 50 to 100 every day. I think it's very kind of them to acknowledge me. <laughs> That's quite nice. I wonder how often Coronation Street stars now are asked for in- uh, autographs. Does it, does it still happen or is it like, is a selfie the new autograph do people want think, autographs anymore? I think also you're more likely to have someone take a sneaky picture of you. Because mm. Kate Ford often says that she she sort of sees people doing that and she doesn't like it and she would prefer it if you would ask her. Yeah. But it's sort of like uh, I would also be in the position of thinking, well, I'm not going to bother her. I don't want to disturb her, but I'll just take a picture and she won't notice. Mm. But I, 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 after reading that, she said that and uh, thinking about, I wouldn't. Not that I've ever had a chance to. I've never really seen anybody yeah. famous out in the wild, but um. I don't think it's a good we, idea. We saw Rick Nealon, actually, Joe. Yeah, we did. Didn't like, we? Now I remind you, Greg oh, Woods, we look, saw Rick Nealon. It, 50 to 100 every day. Can you imagine that? I, mean, I can only that's, imagine that's that these days... That's Exactly, and it's imagine. almost enough to make you big-headed about it, isn't it, if you're that way inclined? I, can, I can't imagine that these days Coronation Street actors get stopped 50 to 100 times a day to be asked for a selfie. <laughs> I'm sure it's something that they're all used to and it happens from time to time. A lot but, of them don't have, don't put themselves into situations where that can really happen. Yeah, I suppose if you're the sort of person that kind of likes it, you will, won't you? Whereas if you want to be a bit more of a, you know, go under the radar and you're a bit shyer, then it's possible to, you know, escape the limelight should you wish. Yeah, it's difficult. It's a difficult one because you can understand both ways. I mean, you. You're not, I don't know, it always feels really, uh, I always think like, if you don't want this to happen at all, you could not be an actor. <laughs> it's, always, it's always an opportunity, like you work so hard to become an actor. I don't know, it just must be very difficult to have this like a level of in if public intrusion yeah i know but yeah you, you have should to just accept- not be so good at it that no, people you want to give ex- you a really good job accepting accepting <laughs> people wanting this from you it must be tough you know mm. to deal with if you're naturally a shy person and a lot of people wouldn't really understand that you can be an actor and be shy oh yeah yeah definitely, definitely. but um 
it is it is really kind of yeah I, I can i think it's kind of funny to imagine either end of the extreme like somebody who's like never speak to me or look me in the eye i'm far too famous for peasants and then the on the other end of the spectrum somebody sort of wandering around with a fair coat on going look at me darling don't you want my <laughs> photograph here's here's a signed picture of myself Ah, oh, so anyway, that's that's Fred G, and, and actually, that was almost that's pretty much it for for Fred Feast in in showbiz as well. Like I said at the beginning, he didn't really have much to do after Coronation Street. He did some epi- a couple of episodes of um, All Creatures Great and Small. He had a couple of cameos in in a few films, and uh, a heart. He was in an episode of Heartbeat. I think that might have been the last thing that he was in in uh, ninety seven ninety eight. He was in um, the Jane Horrocks film Little Voice, which I've heard of but never seen. Um, I think he was a barman in that as well, but yeah, really post Cory, I'm I'm not I don't know what he did. You know, well, lived it up in that him. with that post Cory. All that cash that he made. Yeah, he was <laughs> spending all his Cory cash and getting his autographs and things. But that's it. Yeah, another bit of a sad sad end to the tale, really. But um, I, I'm glad that you you enjoyed Fred because yeah. I, I didn't know what you think of him. I knew that you had no opinion on him, and he's certainly the kind of character that you could have not liked. He, you, you come in well. I think it's easy to come into watching watching Fred um, G without having any preconceptions of him because he's just not a famous character. Mm. So a lot of the time, when you're watching old old episodes of Corey, you're always going to be coloured by the idea of oh here's oh this is Elsie Tanner like she's one of the most famous ones or oh this is Bette Lynch she's a she's a bombastic blonde and she's going to you know have you expect people to act in a certain way mm. and um it can you can end up making the going along with those assumptions yeah but with fred there's nothing there was nothing no. i had to make me think i'm gonna hate or like this and we man. got that with some of the characters from the really early years as well didn't we there were some characters that we were very pleasantly surprised with how much we enjoyed like minnie for example where I love we minnie. knew that she was big but we didn't we had she was, uh, you know, a black. Well, yeah, blank you wouldn't know, like, what us. if Minnie, like, Minnie is pretty much what yeah. you would imagine. We didn't her expect to, be. to love De- Dennis Tanner the way we did. We didn't expect to love um, Ogden or even David, I know. Uh, David uh, Barlow as much as we kind of did. And, and Harry Hewitt, there were quite a lot in the and early Jerry days. Booth. Yeah, a lot. Uh, they were so likable. But as as we get into the eighties and nineties, yeah. and we see more characters that we know that we've seen that that was that still in it when we. A... Yeah, that they either the come with a real reputation or ones that are still, are still in it now. Um, that there are going to be fewer and fewer characters where you you can go into it blind. I mean, uh, maybe Fred will end up being the last one. I don't know. We'll have to wait. Oh uh, yeah. See, this is what I'm kind of worried about. How I'm going to go with the rest of the eighties and the nineties because I can be a bit contrary sometimes. And I was I was quite happy to make my own mind up about what I thought about these characters, but um having lots of like oh yeah this person's a really legendary character or this person mm. you're gonna think this about them yeah. but um yeah fred g was definitely a dark horse <laughs> i don't know i just i think yeah I, I he kind of reminded me of eeyore but if eeyore like <laughs> what uh, if eeyore was ch- cursed, um well, was constantly randy, randy no, chasing eeyore after brought... a kanga <laughs> <laughs> If Eeyore brought his problems upon himself, you know, because Eeyore's blameless, isn't he? He's just depressed. Whereas Fred really only had himself to blame for the majority of his ways, and in a way that makes it worse. Yeah, you're right. Mm. Yeah. If Eeyore was there humping Christopher Owen's mum's leg, then that's about... that's, they'd have the stuff and ripped out of that's my analogy instant. anyway well well done michael good job. right there is fred Thank everybody you this, hope you program. you are now feel suitably informed about this character listener if you didn't know much about him before and if you did know about him before i hope you think we were right and we didn't say anything at all wrong because that never God happens forbid. always 100 percent accurate on this podcast that's what we pride ourselves on isn't it complete Absolutely. accuracy transparency and accountability yes so if you want to tell us anything at all about fred right or wrong email us at conversation street at gmail.com or, or tweet life. us at, at conversation street or join our facebook group or, or find us on instagram or whatever you want really because we'd like to have people get in touch with us and tell us that they've been listening to the podcast and it's inspired them to write in and just say anything say as anything as it's, you as like as nice please say nice and things. not libelous yes definitely that's it thank you everybody for listening and uh we'll be back next next week with more lovely bonusy Coronation bits. Street kind of bits. Exactly. Bonus bits. Boneless bits. <laughs> See you. Get it? I do. Bye. See you next time.
Ta-ra.